All right, welcome to lesson two, four, part A. So it's the chain rule, part one. So the chain rule is actually going to be, it's not so much kind of a rule the way that finding the derivative of a sine or a cosine function is. This is, uh, it's a rule in terms of how you handle particular types of functions. And the chain rule is intended to help us find the derivative of what's called a composition of functions. Now you've studied compositions of functions in previous courses, but I do want to start by making sure we're all sort of on the same page with what exactly that means. Most of the functions that you'll probably encounter in this course eventually will most likely be some sort of a composition of functions. So the chain rule turns out to be one of the most crucial derivative rules because we're going to end up using it so regularly. So let's talk a little bit about compositions of functions. So when I'm talking about a composition of functions, let's say I've got these two different functions here. So f of x equals x to the third, and g of x equals sine of x. And so if you recall, composition of functions might be something like f of g, or fog, maybe you've heard it called. But basically, this means f of g of x. In other words, in f of x, everywhere you have an x, we're replacing g of x. So that means we would have something like f of g of x. And what that means then is, now remember f of x was x to the third, so that means f of g of x would be g of x to the third. But g of x is sine of x, so I could now rewrite that as sine of x to the third, which you may recall, generally we won't write sine of x to the third like this. We would generally write it as sine cubed of x. So sine cubed of x is an example of a composition of functions. Okay, so it's the result of taking one function and substituting it into another function everywhere you would have the variable. And so what the chain rule will allow us to do is it will allow us to find the derivative of a function such as this. So to prepare us for using the chain rule, let's practice decomposing a function. So what if I'm giving you a function? Can we recognize what the two functions, and sometimes more than two, but what are the functions that were composed to give us that particular new function? So we're going to go ahead and practice this where on the left column, I'm going to go ahead and put the actual function, which is a composition of functions. The second column, we're going to try to identify what we're going to refer to as our u. And the u is going to be the inner function. It's the function that got substituted into another function. And then we're going to, for the third column, we're going to try to recognize our y, which will be the outer function. It's the one that got substituted, uh, it's the one that we substituted into. And we're going to keep that one in terms of u instead of x. So for example, this first one, we're going to have y equals 6x to the fifth to the fourth power. Now one of the easiest ways, or one of the most common ways, to recognize your inner function is to look for grouping symbols, things like parentheses, things like uh, being inside of a radical, being the argument of a trig function, being the entire denominator of a fraction. These are all common places to find your inner function. So for this first example here, that 6x minus 5 is inside the parentheses. That's a common place to find our u. So we're going to let u be 6x minus 5. Now if you look at the original function, if I now replaced that 6x minus 5 with a u, then our function becomes y equals u to the fourth. So that's how we can decompose a function that's technically a composition into its separate parts, its separate functions. All right, let's try another one here. So we're going to have y equals the square root 
of x squared plus 1. All right, and once again, a radical serves as grouping symbols because remember, x squared, uh, sorry, the square root of x squared plus 1, remember that that's really the same as saying x squared plus 1 quantity to the 1 half power. So really, a radical isn't too different from this first function that I showed you up here. So if that's the case, then our inner function, once again, is going to be inside those parentheses or inside the radical. It's going to be our x squared plus 1. And that's going to make our outer function y equals u to the 1 half. All right, doing another one. We have y equals the tangent of pi x. Once again, we're going to look for something that's inside parentheses. It, if it might be the argument of a trigonometric function. And when I say the argument, if you're not clear what I mean by that, I mean it's what you're taking the sine or the cosine or the tangent of. So on this problem, we're taking the tangent of pi x. Notice that doesn't just say tangent of x. It's the tangent of more than an x. And that's another common way to recognize what could be your inner function. So for this particular example, we're going to let u equal pi x. And that means we can now have y equal the tangent of u. And let's do one more here. So we're going to have y equals secant to the fourth of x. And again, this one's a little bit tricky unless you remember what I had just showed you earlier. That remember, secant to the fourth of x is really secant of x to the fourth power. And when I write it that way, hopefully it becomes a little bit clearer that we would let our inner function just be the secant of x because it's technically inside parentheses. And then that would make our outer function y equals u to the fourth. Now the reason that we want to do this, the reason that it's so important, notice that these outer functions are all basic functions that we can find the derivative of using any of our existing basic rules. For example, u to the fourth. You can find the derivative of u to the fourth using the power rule. Same with u to the one half. Same with u to the fourth down here. Tangent of u is now one of the derivatives that you've learned from the previous lesson. Remember, the derivative of tangent of u would just be secant squared of u. So that's why we're trying to rewrite these, these compositions of functions in terms of a more basic function that has another function substituted inside of it. So all of that combined is going to allow us to do what's called the chain rule. So here is the chain rule. So the chain rule says for y equals f of g of x such that u equals g of x, so again u is that inner function, and y equals f of u, so uh, again u is that inner function, f is the outer function, then the derivative with respect to x of f of g of x equals f prime of g of x, so again it's the derivative of the outer function still in terms of g of x, times the derivative of g of x. So in other words, it's the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. Another way we can think about the chain rule is using the other notation that you've seen. So the derivative of y with respect to x, so again that's the derivative of this y, with respect to x equals the derivative of y with respect to u. So that means it's the derivative of this y, because that's in terms of u, times the derivative of u with respect to x. And if you notice, sort of visually, it almost looks like these du's cancel out. That's not technically what's happening, because these aren't really fraction quantities in the way that we would normally think. But in terms of sort of visually finding a way to remember what to do, it's not such a bad thing to think about. 
Okay, so that's the chain rule. Let's take a look at several examples that show us how to apply that. Okay, so we're going to find the derivative. Now, technically, we're going to have to find the derivative with the chain rule, but we are not supposed to expect to be told that. We have to be able to recognize when the chain rule is necessary. Okay, so we're dealing with this function here, y equals 3 times the quantity 4 minus x cubed to the fifth. So the first thing we're going to do is exactly what we did a little bit earlier, where I took a composition of functions and I decomposed it. I broke it down. That's the first thing we're going to do. So the first thing we should do is recognize or think about this function in terms of its u and then its y. So once again, u is going to be the inner function. When I look here, I notice that 4 minus x cubed is inside the parentheses. So I'm going to let u equal 4 minus x to the third. And if I now think of the 4 minus x to the third as a u, then that makes the outer function y 3u to the fifth. So that means then to find the derivative to find y prime, I'm finding the derivative of 3u to the fifth. Ah, let me rewrite that. So again, I'm finding the derivative of y with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to x. Well, in this particular example, the derivative of y with respect to u. So again, just ask yourself, what is the derivative of 3u to the fifth? That's just going to be using your power rule. So we move the 5 in front and multiply it with the 3. So that's going to become 15u to the fourth times the derivative of u. So the derivative of 4 minus x to the third. Well, the derivative of 4 goes to a 0. The derivative of negative x to the third becomes negative 3x squared. And then finally, remember, our answer should still be in terms of just an x. So I don't want to now have a u in my final answer. So now we're going to go ahead and substitute u back in. So if I now get y prime equals 15 times 4 minus x cubed to the fourth times negative 3x squared. Let me go ahead and change the color there so you can see where that came from. All right, and then finally, that 15 and that negative 3x squared can get multiplied together, so we should do that. And finally, we get y prime equals negative 45x squared times 4 minus x cubed to the fourth. So again, using the chain rule to find the derivative, we have to first be able to decompose the original function. We have to be able to recognize the inner function and the outer function. Once we've done that, then using the chain rule, we're just finding the derivative of the outer function. So in this case, it was the derivative of 3u to the fifth times the derivative of the inner function. So the derivative of 4 minus x to the third. And then we just substituted back in for the u, and we cleaned it up by simplifying or multiplying things that we're able to. Let's try another one. Okay, so we have y equals the cubed root of x cubed minus 2x. And remember, we can rewrite this radical. In fact, you're going to want to do this fairly often. In general, anytime you see a radical, we're going to pretty much want to rewrite that as a power instead. So I'm going to rewrite this as x to the third minus 2x to the 1 third power. All right, and so now that I've done that, let's identify our inner function and our outer function. So our inner function u, well, that's going to be what's inside the parentheses here. So that's going to be x to the third minus 2x. And then that would make our outer function y. Remember, if I just replace the x cubed minus 2x with a u, that now becomes u to the 1 third. 
So to find the derivative, y prime, again, it's going to be the derivative of the outer function. So the derivative of u to the 1 third is 1 third u to the negative 2 thirds times the derivative of the inner function. So the derivative of x cubed minus 2x, that's going to be 3x squared minus 2. Please notice the parentheses that I put. Those parentheses are necessary. If I don't put the parentheses, right now, the only thing multiplying with the 1 third u to the negative 2 thirds is the 3x squared, and the minus 2 is a second separate term. So again, those parentheses are not optional. They have to be there. All right, and then again, we're going to go ahead and substitute back in for that u. So now I've got 1 third times x cubed minus 2x to the negative 2 thirds, and then times 3x squared minus 2. Now, in the previous example, you saw me multiply this coefficient times this expression, but that's because the second expression was actually just a monomial. It was one term, and we actually were able to get something simpler by multiplying. In this particular instance, because this last part here, whoops, didn't mean to erase all that. Because this last part here is a binomial, multiplying that with the 1 third isn't going to actually simplify things for us. If anything, this is an acceptable final answer. We will eventually have a need to do a little bit more with this, and in particular, that negative power. So alternatively, what we could continue to do is we could now remember that this would be 1 third times 1 over x cubed minus 2x to the positive 2 thirds times 3x squared minus 2. And so finally, when I put all of that together, my numerator, I just get that 3x squared minus 2. And in the denominator, I've got that 3 times x cubed minus 2x to the positive 2 thirds power. And so this form of the derivative will be a little bit more useful to us if we were to try to do things like, will this derivative ever equal 0 to indicate that the original function has a horizontal tangent? Or we might try to figure out, will this derivative ever be undefined, where maybe the denominator becomes a 0? So that's one of the reasons that we would consider continuing to rewrite the function. But for our purposes of just making sure that you can use the chain rule, this first answer is acceptable. All right, let's look at an example using a trig function with the chain rule. So I've got y equals cotangent of pi x cubed plus 2. So once again, we're going to identify our inner function and our outer function. So our u, our inner function, Again, because I'm taking the cotangent of this expression, that inside expression is my u. So my u will be pi x cubed plus 2. And that would make the y, the outer function, just the cotangent of u. And before I continue, just a real quick uh, note or hint. What you're using for your outer function, your y, it should be a basic function, or it should only involve a basic derivative. In other words, look at this function here, the cotangent of u. Do we have a rule to find the cotangent of u, or the cotangent of just an x? And if the answer is yes, then you probably are on the right track for choosing your outer function. OK, so y prime equals, so the derivative of the outer function, you just recently learned the derivative of cotangent. Remember, that's going to be negative cosecant squared of u times the derivative of pi x to the third plus 2. Now, remember, pi is just a constant, but you can't really do anything with it. So it's even though it's a constant, it gets treated almost like a variable. So to find the derivative of pi x to the third, that's just going to become 3 pi x squared. And then the derivative of 2 is just a 0, so that goes away. 
And then now I'm going to do two things here at the same time. Hopefully you're okay with this. I'm going to go ahead and move this 3 pi x squared into the front and multiply it with that negative. So that's going to give me a negative 3 pi x squared times cosecant squared of, and so the other thing I'm going to do in the same step is again I'm going to substitute that u back with pi x cubed plus 2. And that is the chain rule for that, pro that particular problem. Okay, so this example is going to pose a particularly new challenge for us. So we've got y equals 4 times sine cubed of x squared plus 5. So just like you saw me do before though, let's go ahead and rewrite this so that we write this as 4 times the sine of x squared plus 5 quantity cubed. Because remember, that's what the original function is really saying. So if that's the case, then our u, again, would be this inner function here, which would be sine of x squared plus 5. And then our outer function would be y equals 4u to the third. The problem is, notice that our u is also a composition of functions. Our u is not a basic function whose derivative we also could find just using basic rules. We would have to use the chain rule there as well. So what that means is now I'm going to have to recognize that in addition to having our u, we're actually going to also make this a v. So I'm going to treat x squared plus 5 as a v, which means our u is really the sine of v. Again, your goal is to make sure that you're decomposing this function enough so that each individual function you have would only require a basic derivative rule. If it would require another chain rule, then you need to break it down some more. And that means then, to find the derivative, to find y prime, I have to find the derivative of each of these components with respect to the variable that we see there. So the derivative of y, that's going to be, using the power rule, 12u to the second times, now I have the derivative of u, well that's the derivative of sine of v. So the derivative of sine of v is going to be cosine of v times, and then the derivative of v, so that's the derivative of x squared plus 5, that's just going to be 2x. Now we need to substitute everything back in. So I've got y prime equals, so I've got 12 times my u, remember u was sine of x squared plus 5, and remember that's all still being squared, times the cosine of v, but remember that v was x squared plus 5, and then times 2x. Now, we have a couple of things we can do here. So first of all, we do have a 12 times a 2x. So we can multiply those together. And that's going to give me 24x. I'm going to put that in front times. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and return this squared to where we would typically write it for a trig function. So I'm going to write this as 24x times sine squared of x squared plus 5 times the cosine of x squared plus 5. So that's an example of a composition of functions where we actually have multiple nested functions. We have multiple chain rules to do. But it doesn't significantly change what you do. Notice to, to, to find the derivative, I still just found the derivative of each of the separate functions and multiply those together. Okay, and then we've got this example here, y equals 5 over x cubed plus 8x minus 5. Now, 
you just recently learned the quotient rule, and if you look at this, this is technically a quotient. This is 5 divided by x cubed plus 8x minus 5. Now, those of you who have already completed the quotient rule assignment, you realize just how inconvenient the quotient rule could be because of the amount of work involved. But now that we know the chain rule, we could rewrite this function as 5 times x cubed plus 8x minus 5 to the negative first power. And by doing that, I no longer have a quotient for this particular problem. Instead, I can now use this as a composition of functions where my inner function is x cubed plus 8x minus 5, and my outer function is now just 5u to the negative first power. So that means to find the derivative, I can just do y prime equals, all right, so the derivative of y is going to be negative 5 u to the negative second, and then times the derivative of this trinomial here, again, parentheses necessary, that's going to be 3x squared plus 8. Again, the minus 5, the derivative of that goes to a 0. And then let's go ahead and substitute back in. So y prime equals negative 5 times, again, our u was x cubed plus 8x minus 5. Again, that's now to the negative second. And then we've got times 3x squared plus 8. And again, for our purposes today, this answer here is acceptable. But it's not going to take a whole lot more work. All we would do to make this exponent positive is move this factor to the denominator. And we would get y prime equals a negative 5 times 3x squared plus 8 all over the quantity x cubed plus 8x minus 5 squared. So that illustrates the chain rule. Now, just one follow-up question, and let's go ahead and just use this last example since we already have the derivative sitting here. So remember, some of the questions that you've been asked up to this point, and I just don't want you to forget it. So with the same question, I could now ask, find the slope of this graph at the point 0, 1 fifth. Oops, sorry. I've changed the function, so this is actually now 0, 1. So find the slope of this graph at the point 0, comma, negative 1. Now remember, slope of the graph, this is actually just another variation of saying the slope of the tangent line. So when you see the slope of the graph, that is referring to the derivative at this particular point. So they are asking us to find the derivative and evaluate it at 0. So we already found the derivative. We know that the derivative is this y prime right here. So that means to find the slope of the graph at the point 0, comma, negative 1, I'm just finding y prime of 0. So according to my function over here, that's going to be negative 5 times, so 3, all of the terms with an x, they're all going to go away because it's a 0. So I'm going to have negative 5 times an 8 over, so again, x cubed goes to a 0, 8x becomes a 0. I'm just going to have a negative 5 squared. And that's going to become negative 40 divided by positive 25. And I can reduce this by a factor of 5, and I'm going to get negative 8 over 5. So again, just don't want you to forget some of these other questions that you've been asked before in the past. Okay, so these are some examples of using the chain rule. Again, the chain rule is going to be a derivative rule that you're going to find yourself using more often than not. So it's super important that you make sure you're as comfortable with using this as possible. All right, good luck.